ain't got nothing on this one I didn't well folks I have Peter Tompkins with me today and Peter has the PT pop YouTube channel which I enjoy very much and Pete interviewed me going back I guess about three months ago or so we had a great chat about the Beatles and uh, I'm sure we'll talk somewhat about the Beatles in this conversation as well but there's other topics that I'd like to cover with Peter and uh, Peter is a musician a songwriter an artist and a filmmaker I recently watched his, one of his documentaries, Road to Forgiveness. It's one of two. His other one is The Artist, and I'll put the links down below in the description box. And Peter, I have to tell you, Road to Forgiveness was very good. It was, uh, I tip my hat to you because it was very personal and you put it out there as far as what alcohol does to the family structure. Oh, thanks, Megan. Thanks, thanks for having me on today. And yeah, I uh, I appreciate you watching that video and you know, I've always been very open about that side of my life with people as far back as I can, you know, even friends I had in high school, they eventually I would tell them what was going on at home and they couldn't believe it. They were just like, oh, you, you know, you're full of it. You, you know, how could this have happened to you? And, you know, you run into a lot of people that are very skeptical because the story, while it's not as bad as some, it's it's pretty crazy what, what we all went through. So I, I appreciate the support. Yeah, I was able to relate to it. We had alcoholism in my family as well. And uh, it wasn't to the extent that you experienced, I, I will say that, but it was, it was still not a good thing, especially between the periods of, in my life from 1970, I guess at that point I was, I was 11 through 1980. So there was a decade where our family was dealing with my father's alcoholism. It wasn't a good thing. With us, what happened was there's four kids and none of us drink. Some people find that amazing because they believe that if you come from a family where alcohol is present or prominent in the, the dynamics of the family, that the children could very well wind up with a drinking problem as well. But that didn't happen with us. We went the other way. We saw the, the detriments of alcoholism and the destructive nature of it. And we said, no, we're not going to not going to go there so there's four of us and none of us drink well i just want well, first want to say i'm sorry as i said in a, in a private email i'm sorry you had to go through that as well and uh since i've made this film i found people have come out of the woodwork so to speak that have had experiences like ours and you know they, nobody talks about it and, and it's unfortunate because yeah. part of the healing process you've got to talk um myself i didn't drink until i was 19 i was determined to never drink because of what i saw my parents go through and then I joined a fraternity and got talked into drinking, which is not their fault. I just, I, you know, I wanted to fit in. I wanted to meet girls. I wanted to, I was very uptight and shy. It made me loosen up. And at first it was just, you know, I just drank on the weekends in college, Friday and Saturday night. That was it. Then I got out of college and I saw the real world or what it had to offer me, I guess you'd say, or, or, or lack thereof. 
I started to drink more. I started to rely on it a lot. And um, I didn't get anywhere near as bad as my dad. But it, it did start to become a crutch, something I relied on to relax or, you know, enjoy a rainy day or, uh, you know, any excuse I could get, I'd buy a six pack or a 12 pack or whatever. But it never got to the point where I was hiding bottles and getting fired from jobs. I, ne I never went to work drunk, but, you know, I occasionally now have a drink. But uh, it was something, it's something I wish I had never done. But it, it definitely gave me a new perspective on my father and my mother because, as I said in you know my film, it kind of helped me walk in their shoes to kind of see how hard it is to put it down once you pick it up. <clears throat> and it's extremely difficult just to walk away from it because it's so it's so uh, it woven into our the fabric of our society and it's it's in all the TV shows and the movies. Just have a drink to relax. Just have a drink if you want to hit on a woman. Just have a drink if you're feeling sad. You know. So it's it's really hard to walk away from once you take that first sip, and uh, it's it's a good thing you and your siblings haven't. It's it's not worth it. When I say we didn't drink, what I meant was we didn't we never drank to excess. So we would be social drinkers if there was a barbecue or we went went out maybe have a beer or two. But then I reached a point in my life, going back I guess about I don't know uh, maybe fifteen years ago or so where I just stopped, didn't drink anything anymore, even a beer. And it wasn't because there was ever a problem. It was one of those things where I just walked away from it and never looked back. So what I want to say to the audience is um, Peter's documentary is excellent. Uh, my wife and I sat down, we watched it. And uh, I think it's very important to watch because you're getting personal insight from somebody who experienced an alcohol-affected family situation. And I know that there are a lot of people, a lot of families that have to go through this or have gone through it. I know this because, uh, you know, I have friends and family as well that experience this and it's unspoken. We just don't talk about it for various reasons. One being that it's, it could be embarrassing to talk about and uh, you don't want to air your dirty laundry out in public, but uh, maybe that's not the best way to go about it. We probably should have a more open dialogue about these types of situations. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's not easy to talk about. And I've, you know, I've talked to classmates from high school that, you know, they'll come up and tell me, well, my dad drank and he would get drunk and just pass out in a chair. And, I, and I'm like, well, that's not really what I'm talking about. You know, they won't see the film, but I, I tell them what it's about. And But it gets people talking. You know, I don't put them down or anything, but there's different levels, I think, of addiction. Like my dad was like a heroin addict. When it came to booze, I mean, he there was nothing that would stand between him and his next drink. So, but, but not everybody gets to that point. Uh, the idea behind the film was to try to show somebody, nobody like me. You know, I don't, I'm not famous. If I could tell my story in front of the world, maybe it would inspire other people to open up, maybe go to Al-Anon meetings, <clears throat> maybe face their addictions, and you know, confront the demons of their childhood and things like that. Yeah, I agree. So I'm going to, like I said, put the link down below and highly recommend it. And Peter has another documentary, which I have not yet watched, and that's The Artist. And there'll be a link down below for that as well. So, Peter, I was wondering if you could just take the audience through your journey in life. I know from watching the videos on your channel that you spent time in the corporate world. You are a musician, a songwriter, a very good songwriter. You have uh, five albums, five CDs, yes? Yeah. And you're an artist and a, obviously you're a filmmaker. So if you could just take us through your journey, that would be great. Well, I'll start with my mom. Um, my mom was my original inspiration to become an artist. She was a phenomenal fine artist. She could just do just about anything. She could paint, draw, sculpt, you name it. She could do it and do it well. She wasn't just, you know, a weekend warrior. She had a natural gift. So I was initial, initially inspired by her to go to college and study art and do all those things. But when I was eight years old, it was the, I guess it was February of 1974, there was a 10th anniversary special of the Beatles coming to America on, and appearing on Ed Sullivan. And I saw this, it was just a little segment, probably on 60 Minutes or one of those old TV shows. Well, I guess this show still on the air, but, and I was just riveted. I was just fascinated with the Beatles. And, um, you know, I'm going to jump forward. I, I dreamed of becoming a rock star. I was going to become... You know, I was going to get in the big band and have all the girls and all that stuff. And, you know, I was only eight years old. I didn't know any better. So I just started becoming 
oriented in the arts at a very young age. Like when other kids were still playing with Tonka trucks and Legos, I was listening to the Beatles and Sgt. Peppers and stuff like that. When the other kids are like, what, what are you doing listening to rock and roll music? You know, they thought I was I was a weirdo. I was a nerd, I guess. <laughs> and, you know, and this is in the 70s uh, when it's, it's just weird because I think back, you know, I was the only one that knew who Elvis was. I, you know, all this stuff. A lot of the kids I grew up with, we were in a kind of a country town. And I, I guess you just didn't do that when when you're a little kid in the 1970s in my small town. So and then I, I went to college to study art. I was told by an advisor back then that I had two choices with a fine arts degree. I could teach or work work at Kinko's. <laughs> and I didn't want to teach. I'd already done that at a summer camp at the daycare, and it was, it was a nightmare. And Kinko's was new at the time. It was a huge, you probably remember, there were big stores where you go and get your copies done and have somebody do graphic design for you. And I was like, I don't want to do this. So I switched my degree to business. <laughs> And that was my first big mistake in life is going because at heart, I'm really an artist. I'm, I'm not a corporate person. And I went into the business school and my grades just completely plummeted. But I graduated with a degree in communications and public speaking, of all things. I thought I was going to become like a famous speech writer or something. And I marched off campus when I graduated with my little diploma thinking I was going to go out and be somebody. I was going to show them my diploma and they were going to hand me $30,000 a year, which was a lot of money 40 years ago or 30, 36 years ago. And that didn't happen. So I, um, I struggled for a couple of years working in a factory. And then I got my first corporate job when I was about 24, I guess, 23 or 24. And then the corporate world was a whole, my whole life has been shaped by popular culture. So everything I think about at one time, everything I thought about love or business or working or college was shaped by romanticized movies and TV shows. So I thought I'd go off and find this luxurious job and work in a big glass building. And, and I did do all of those things, but in, inside that building, it was nothing like you think it was going to be. So I got very disillusioned and ended up years later coming back to becoming an artist again. I spent, I, I mentioned to you before we got started here, I spent over 30 years in the corporate world. And but I was always a um, a creative person, and the thing that I found, Peter, during my career in the corporate world was that even though I was very good at what I did, I always felt like a fish out of water. I never felt like I belonged there. It was one of those things that when the time came when I was able to step out, it was a good thing. It was almost like it was uh, a huge weight was taken off of my shoulders because I no longer had to go in and go do something that, to be honest, like I said, I was never overly comfortable with. The business world, the corporate world, wasn't really what I was, um, in my mind, supposed to be doing, although having that experience has helped me now in the work that I do when you take a look at the alternative research and conspiracy research, because you can see how the whole corporate world, the corporatocracy is all embedded and intertwined with everything that's going on in the world with the one world agenda that they're trying to push forward. I don't have any regrets per se, because I realize that in life, we have to experience the experience. So it, it was a stepping stone to uh, the next part of my life. But the point being is, when you're in the corporate world, you're not really doing for you. You're doing for corporate entities, for stockholders and stakeholders and so on. So you're not really investing in yourself. You're investing outside of yourself. And it got to the point where I just didn't want to do that anymore. Oh, yeah, I completely agree. And I I think it's funny. When I was in high school, I did really well. I, I, I was liked by my teachers. Um, I played sports. The coaches liked me. They would, you know, uh, encourage me and give me good feedback. And I thought, wow, you know, I'm, I always thought of myself as this really nice guy, hardworking, knows the grindstone kind of type of guy. But when I got in the corporate world, I wasn't getting any praise. I was getting, hey, do you want to go out for drinks with us tonight? We're going down to the Winking Lizard. I'm like, no, not really. I, I don't really do that. And they're like, oh, okay. And then people would stop talking to me because I wasn't a socialite or I wasn't boozing it up with them. And or I was very quiet and shy. I was very uh, timid when I was very young. And I found myself just not fitting in. And I then I started to see how deceptive they were with our customers. 
Now, I'm not going to name companies I worked for, but I found they had a lot of deceptive practices. I got into sales over the phone a little bit. I saw how deceptive that was. And I thought, this isn't for me. I don't want to trick people into buying junk that they really don't need just because I want to make my quotas. And I just saw it as being a very dark, deceptive place. And they're paying you pennies basically for your soul. I know that sounds a bit dramatic, but you're, you're you know, they pay your life insurance and your health insurance and they, you're paying, they're paying for your mortgage basically. And you're trapped in this deceptive world. And so I, yeah, I found it to be, I was totally, you know, an artist in corporate clothing. People saw that I wasn't a conformist. It's a strange place to work. Yeah, it's a very strange dynamic, the corporate world. It's not for everybody. And, uh, you know, some people really thrive in it. They love it. Others kind of survive in it. And, and then there's that segment of the population that are there and they realize that I really don't belong here, you know. So, but like I said, in my case, uh, it served a purpose. I moved on. It's allowed me to be able to grow into the stuff that I'm doing today. So, Peter, while you were in the corporate uh, environment, how did that impact your creative work, being a musician, a songwriter, an artist, or a filmmaker? Were you able to do both at the same time, or did it essentially shut that down for a period of time? Um, it kind of, kind of both. Because when I was in the corporate world, I, I figured I had made it. You know, I, I thought I had become somebody. <laughs> and, you know, you're sitting in a cubicle with the suit on and back when people wore suits and sports coats. And I thought I had made it. So I put it all. I put a guitar down. I put all the paints down. And I said, well, screw it. I'm better than those artists. But inside, I knew that was a lie, especially when I started falling on my face in the corporate world. It just wasn't me. And what had happened is I had... I was in a meeting once uh, at, a, at a telephone company where I worked and, and you know, big boardroom with the oak table. And I'm, I'm sketching the guy next to me. I'm drawing, I have a pencil and I'm drawing him. And a girl is looking over my shoulder and she's like, did you just draw that? And I said, yeah. And she's like, what are you doing here? You should be out doing art or something. And I, I'd always use that as an inspiration. She doesn't, I don't even know who, who don't even remember her last name, but if I could see her, I would thank her because she, put this bug in my ear, this is around the year 2000, uh, or I put it in my head that I should reconsider my my pursuit of art. Well, when I was working in the corporate world, it was always in the back of my head, This I should I should be doing my art. I should really be home playing the guitar. I should go back to school, finish, get my BFA, things like that. And I met my wife in 2002, and we moved to Arizona, and she got a job where she was making like twice what I was making. And she said, you know, you can go back to school now because we can afford to have you go back to school. So I went back to school out in Arizona and I studied, I initially studied web design and graphic design. And I stumbled on photography uh, in some of the classes. And I started my own business out in Arizona doing portrait and pet photography. I kind of haven't look, looked back since. I, I have had a few jobs as I talk about my in my uh, YouTube channel about working in call centers, but usually I go back to that um, call center gig if we run into hard times or Meg gets laid off, and, and she was about to get laid off in 2008 when the market crashed. So I quit my business and started going back to the call center gig. And she found a job, so I quit that one, you know, and went back and forth. Now she, she was just recently laid off. She's laid off like three weeks ago from a, that company from 15 years ago. So now I'm back. I still have my YouTube channel and my podcast and my films, but they don't make a whole lot of money. So now I, we're scrambling, trying to figure out what do I do? Where do we live? Because we can move now to a different city where there's more jobs. But, um, yeah, to answer your question, yeah, art – has always been in the back of my mind, but it's been about 15 years now that I've been focusing solely on uh, filmmaking, photography in, in my podcast and YouTube channel. And the corporate world really drove me out of it because I, I couldn't I couldn't be who I really was. I really was, like you said, a fish out of water. I was didn't fit in with any of those people or the politics or the backstabbing. Um, and I needed to be who I was. And I, you know, I don't miss the corporate world. I miss the money. There's not stability in it anymore. My father-in-law, before he passed away, why don't you get a job? You know, he worked for the IRS for 40 years. Well, that doesn't happen anymore. Maybe the IRS you can. But 
nobody has jobs for 40 years anymore. So I don't know if that answered your question, but yeah, I, I, it, it was always at the back of my mind to be continue being an artist when I was in the corporate world. No, it did answer the question. It's always interesting to me to get others' perspectives who, like I mentioned when we started the conversation, who worked in the corporate world, but they're really creative people inside. And how do they manage that? What happened to you is what happened to me, I think. You got to a point where uh, you realized that there was a, a moment where you had to step out and you had to live the life that you wanted to live, which is driven by creativity. But I did want to ask you, going back to Road to Forgiveness, um, I had mentioned it was a, at a very personal level. What did it take for you to to decide, Peter, that, you know, I'm going to go do this? Because it is so personal that there had to be moments in time where you're weighing, do I do this? Do I not do this? Do I put my life out there? I mean, do, do I open the window and let everybody take a look inside my house? How did that work? How did that decision process, uh, how did that come about? Well, my first documentary was The Artist. And it, that's basically a film. I was trying to make a film about what it's really like to be an artist. And But if you go back before that film, I wanted to go to college. I wanted to get my master's degree in filmmaking. And then COVID hit. And I, dro I got accepted to Ohio University in their film school. But I dropped out before school started because of COVID. So I had always wanted to make films. I hadn't always, but I always wanted to get involved in documentaries. And the artist didn't exactly go the way it wanted it to at first. It was supposed to be a completely different movie, but people decided not to be in it. And I decided not, you know, it metamorphosized and changed shapes as the year went by. And I'd always wanted to tell our family story. And I was confused whether I should do it because there's really, I come from a family of six, including my parents, but both my parents are gone. And I don't speak to my older siblings anymore. So they, they don't speak to me I don't speak to them and I thought well this is really I just wanted to be my story I didn't want it to be disparaging about them but how do I tell this story without their input and you know I thought well you know maybe I should try to get them involved but I think one's in North Carolina another's in, I think in Southern California and my uh, other sibling is in Southern Ohio and I thought eh, I'll just do it myself I'll just tell my perspective of it because it's you know my perspective is kind of like the parable of three blind men being led to a, three different parts of an elephant. And, you know, the first guy thinks an elephant is long and thin and strong. The other thinks he's fat and furry. And the other thinks he's curly because they, you know, they go to different parts of the elephant. So, so my story is just my perspective of, you know, everyone's got their own version of it and from different ages too. So I, I struggled with it because number one, I didn't want it to make it look like I was putting my parents down. Because some people have said, how can you do that? How can you talk about your parents when they have no way to defend themselves and stuff like that? And like, well, I'm not telling a lie. They're like, but out of respect, how can you talk about your parents like this? Well, you know what? Somebody's got to do it. I, I just thought the story was powerful. And I thought this is a story that was powerful because these were just two ordinary people, you know, and people make fun of alcoholics in, in media you know, you've got Arthur, you've got Otis and Mayberry and, and a variety of other comical characters that are drunks. And I would see those people and I would laugh at it. Sure. But there's nothing funny about it. There's really nothing funny about the town drunk. My dad was the town drunk and it was embarrassing. It was it was horrifying to see him on the streets. So why not tell the story, number one, to try to help other people tell their story was one of my motives. And I think it's a pretty powerful story. Um, even though I took it to a couple of producers, it's kind of funny. I took it to a local producer here in Cleveland. He's like, ah, everybody's got the story. I said, this story has addiction, homelessness, and murder in it. You've got three of the best elements for a story. You don't want to, oh, nah. And I was like, <laughs> that's another, you know, we don't have to get sidetracked into Hollywood. I've never dealt with Hollywood, but I've come close to it a couple of times. And it's like, that's a whole nother dark evil, deceptive place. Uh, I include that with the music business. But yeah, I struggled with it because I didn't want to paint my parents to be like monsters. And, and it was like this tightrope of trying to tell a story about forgiveness at the same time showing like the horrors that kind of we all went through 
and without making everybody look like terrible people. I went through so many edits of this, and it's it's hard because you're interviewing yourself. There, there was no one in the room with me. I was pretending to be talking to someone off camera. So you're just like you're pretending there's you know somebody interviewing you. So you had to, and I know the story too because we've all been through the story. We're a very um, nostalgic family, so a lot of the things are kind of ingrained because mom, when she was still living, we'd go on a tour of all the houses we lived in. In, in just a few years, you know, we went from one house to the next house. Oh, remember this house? And we drive to another part of town. And, oh, remember this is where dad did this and this house. And it was kind of a twisted way of reminiscing for her. So a lot of the stories and the things I, I, I grew up experiencing are just like ingrained in my head. So it was hard. It wasn't an easy thing to do. Um, and it took me about a year to, to put it all together and finally come up with the final edit and pulling together photographs and stories. There's so many things I left out. I mean, I, I left out the federal agent showing up at our front door looking for dad and just other things that, wonderful things that he had done that, that we still talk about if if we were talking, but you know, we, we joke about it. We, uh, we make a joke out of it. I guess it's one way of coping. When I watched the documentary, Peter, I did not get a sense that you were disparaging your parents. It was a your personal perspective on what it is that you as Peter were going through and feeling because of the situation in the family. I thought, like I said, I thought you did a great job with it. Now you mentioned murder. Your father was murdered. Yeah. Yeah. He was killed by his girlfriend. Yeah. That was wild. And it's funny. I wrestled with whether to name the woman who did it in the film. And I thought, well, I don't really harbor this is another weird thing with me is I don't harbor any ill will towards that woman. But I thought, do I really want to put her family through that? Do I put her name? Do I want to be come out and say, this is the person who did it? It's like, no, no. Um, it's so weird how that all came about, how my mother found out about it. She, my mom listened to the police scanner. And I don't think I mentioned this in the film, but my mom was, she had one of those Bearcat police scanners. And one night she heard my dad's social security number come over the, the radio waves. And she's like, oh, that can't be good. She knew his social security number. So she found out before anybody else knew, because she knew all the police codes. She had them all written down on a piece of notebook paper. So I, I don't know what it, what the code was for murder, but she knew he had been killed. So yeah, it was a very traumatic event, a very life-changing event for me. And and I hadn't spoken to my dad in years. It, I don't know if you want me to talk about how he died or Whatever you're comfortable talking about, Peter. Yeah, he just, from what I understand, he got into a fight. Well, no, my dad was sleeping. And his girlfriend, I think my dad was about to leave. And my dad's aunt, my great aunt, had passed away and left him like 2500 bucks. And this is 1987, so that's probably the equivalent of, what, ten grand today? I don't know. It's not, it's not a lot of money, but back then it was a sizable amount, enough for him to leave. He wanted to leave this this lady and he had told her, I'm, you know, I'm hitting the bricks. I got some cash. And he should have, he should have never told her because I guess she did, you know, she had that, um, what kind of love they call that, um, you know, basically if I can't have you, nobody, nobody can. So she, she put a couple of slugs into his back while he was sleeping and she took her life. And it was just so traumatic because I hadn't spoken to him because I didn't hate my dad. We just didn't want anything to do with him. He was the town drunk. It's like, okay, out of sight, out of mind, go away. You're divorced now. We don't want anything to do with you. But, you know, he's still your he's still your father. So when he died, it was devastating. It was a, a horrific event. And I don't think he deserved to go that way. I don't I don't know what this woman's issues were, but she obviously has some mental issues. And this this taught me a lesson is he, he met her in program. He met her in AA. And they always say in program, you should never date anybody in program. Because you, you're both, you're dealing with powder kegs, and I think that hit home to me. So, yeah, it was a real traumatic event. It was a, a traumatic way for his life to end. And I've always wondered if he sobered up. I don't know if he ever stopped drinking. I, I have no idea. And uh, I haven't spoken to him. I haven't spoken to him since like 19. 
oh, I think 82, when I was a sophomore in high school, I got a letter from him when he was in, not prison, but he was in jail for DUI in the local uh, sheriff's, we call it the safety center in the county I grew up in. And he, it's funny because he wrote to me and he said, every time I hear a Beatles song, what did he say? He said, I, every time I hear a Beatles song, I think of you. And I, I still have the letter. I was going to put that in the film, but that just it just shows you how much I was into the Beatles. And that's all, it's all I talked about. But that, that the Beatles were my saviors during this whole thing, even during his death. But it, it also made me think of John Lennon's death because up until a certain point in my life where I didn't really idolize John anymore, his death, my dad's death, and John's death were so similar, it was almost too much to take. Because John Lennon was more of a father to me than my father was, which is scary because I didn't know John. I thought I knew John Lennon. As, as I've said in other videos, all of us Beatle freaks think we know John, Paul, George, and Ringo. We think we know them intimately, but we, as John said, you haven't got a clue. But at one point, I looked at him as like this father figure, which fortunately I didn't follow in John Lennon's footsteps because I don't think uh, – some of the things he did were any better than what my dad did, regardless of the of songs he allegedly wrote or whatever he did. You know, I see it differently now as a grown man that and thank God I didn't drop acid and do all the things that I don't think I'd be here today if I dropped acid as much as he allegedly did. So, but yeah, that that's kind of what happened. And it's, it's really tough. And I've even thought of starting a podcast to talk, talk about murder in the family. And get people on here to talk about it because you see these TV shows, First 48 and all this stuff where somebody gets shot in a drive-by shooting or in a gang gang then thing. In in the movies they portray it one way, but in real life it's totally totally different. It's nothing like you see it in the movies. Right. So if we talk, Peter, about the Beatles in your documentary Road to Forgiveness, you have a whole segment on how the Beatles became a coping mechanism for you that it kind of pulled you away from the dysfunction that was going on in your family, and it brought you basically into a different world that you much preferred. So did you want to talk about that a little bit? Um, yeah, the Beatles, you had mentioned something in, in an interview with another gentleman about, um, I can't remember what you called it. You you had related to the Beatles and the, the assassination of JFK. Traumatic conditioning or something you called it? Trauma-based conditioning. Trauma-based conditioning, that's it. And when the Beatles, when I found the Beatles, things were really awful, so awful in my family. We were, we were, you know, poor on food stamps. My dad was beating my mom all the time. But yeah, the Beatles came into my life at a time where I needed a savior or a savior, so to speak. And when I found their music, it was an escape. It, it, it was happy. It was fun. And it was something that lifted me up and took me literally, not physically, but mentally and emotionally out of this craziness and into a happy place and i just completely i you know i was very obsessive as a kid anyway i was a very not ocd but just upset become obsessed about things and i immediately became obsessed with the beat obsessed with the beatles and that's all i talked about and and i i needed their records and i wanted it's 1975 and i was trying to buy beetle boots and they hadn't made them in like 10 years and I drove my parents crazy driving to the, all the malls, May Company and Higby's. And I don't know if they had that stuff in the East Coast, but department stores looking for Beetle Boots. And they're like, you know, they, they, don't, they don't make them anymore. And I'm sorry. And it was just like, I just went nuts. And it was just a, it was a happy time. It was, for me, it was happy. I don't know what my family thought. They probably thought I'd lost my marbles, but. I was just a huge Beatles fan, and it saved me. Their music and their humor saved me from a lot of bad times from the age of eight onward until I kind of came out of my trance. I, I call it my Beatles trance or my Beatles Beatlemania phase. But, yeah, their music inspired me to become a musician and further myself as an artist. They're why I have all this junk around me and guitars and lights and cameras. I mean, I can't blame it all on them some of this is just stuff i've i come from a family my brothers both like electronics i had an uncle that liked electronics so it's kind of in our in our dna i think so yeah the beatles were a huge influence they uh, john lennon was my idol i idolized his his philosophies and 
is music. And it's so funny because the other day I was listening to the song God off of the Plastic Ono Band album. And he denounces, you know, God and Buddha and, and all these people. And I'm thinking the only one he didn't denounce was the devil. It's the only one he doesn't say, I don't believe in the devil. Like, that's kind of weird. Of all the things to leave out, why did he leave the devil out? I'm 58, and I never thought of that. And like, that fits in with the, you know, I don't believe this and this and this and this, but I don't know why he left that one out. And I can just leave that hanging out there. But, you know, rumor was he was very into the occult and tarot cards and numerology, Ouija boards numerology. and all that. Yeah. So who knows? <laughs> so if you think about it, the, the Beatles are very powerful and they, they had a huge grip on me. But they, in a way, they saved me, uh, and I'm grateful for that. But I, there came a time where it no longer had its hold on me than it once did. I have very fond memories of the Beatles growing up. I bugged my parents. It was in 1968. I was nine years old. I knew who they were, loved them. I wanted to go see Yellow Submarine. My father took us. I've told this story on a number of other shows. My brother and I went, and uh, I know my father had a lot better things to do for an hour and a half than to sit through the uh, the Yellow Submarine movie. But that's my first real memory of really wanting to invest my time in the Beatles, going back to uh, you know 1968, 67, around there. And I have a lot of fond memories, too. Um, they made me happy. I was a Beatle fanatic. I was a Beatle freak. I had all of their vinyl. I still have a vinyl collection of Beatle records that rivals probably anything that most people have. I have some very, very rare vinyl that's today is worth a couple of bucks. I had all this and still do. I've gotten rid of a lot of it, but I still have a lot of memorabilia. It's the reason why I picked up a guitar. It's the reason why I started to uh, to write songs and want to record and and all of that stuff. But as you mentioned, and I watched one of your videos, I, I think it might have been one of your um, now and then videos where, and I'm paraphrasing here, but, and you just mentioned it here too, where you evolved out of that stage of worship. You come to grips with the fact that, you know, the story is not all that was presented to us. Of course, a lot of people have not evolved out of it. There's still so many people who are in their 50s, 60s, and 70s who idolize the Beatles to this day and have them up on the pedestal not realizing that there's so much more to it. So when was the point, Peter, where you started to evolve away from them and say, oh, you know what? I can't be into this worship game anymore with them. When did that happen? For me, it happened in um, 2016 when I started, when I first read, I should say, the first edition of the book, The Memoirs of Billy Shear. So for me, it was only seven years ago. Yeah, it's, it's funny because there have been moments throughout my fascination with the band where I questioned the original story and, and one of them when I was really young and I read about this guy in their band oh geez my mind just went blank the guy, the guy that played bass for them in, in the cavern and Stuart Sutcliffe yeah Stuart Sutcliffe so so I'm, I'm a little kid and I'm reading these stories these great stories and they're in the, they're in their leather and they're it's guy Stu Sutcliffe that can't play bass and they prop him up on the front of the stage with his back to the audience so, so no one can tell he can't play. And I'm like, what? And and I'm like, this is crazy. It doesn't make any sense. I'm like, I, I have a friend from high school named Mike Zuter, who's a, who's a well, I'll say his full name because he's a fairly well-known kind of rock star in my, in, my, in my group. And he used to play all the mixers in our high school, you know, after school in the gymnasium. And if I'd walked up to him and said, hey, can I just bring my guitar and stand there? Just so girls will like me, he'd be get the fuck out of here. Is what he'd say. What What are you talking about? So I started to kind of question it. It was in the back of my mind, like this story doesn't make any sense. And then in 1977, I think they released the Star Club recordings, the double album. I think it was 77 or 78. And I, I was, I couldn't wait to hear this. I'm like seventh grade or something. And I put it on the turntable. I'm like, I'm like, what is this? This is horrible. This is the Beatles. And even as a kid, I'm like, they sound terrible. And I wasn't even a musician yet. I'd never played a note in the guitar yet. So initially, there was always this kind of like, hmm, this is kind of weird. But I think, you know, I started to lose interest in, in the 90s 
Well, actually, I'll, uh, the defining moment was when I started hearing, seeing your videos. That was the defining moment. But leading up to it, Flaming Pie came out. And I went, this album is terrible. I, it's not terrible. It's all right. But people were raving about this album. And I think it went to number one. I'm like, this went to number one? Why? I thought this isn't – and I, I bought the CD, and I, I had it in my car, and I would listen to it. But I was like, uh, okay. So my interest started to wane. But then I started to I started to question the narrative of how did this band go from the leather guys in the cavern who couldn't really play very well to superstardom? And then I saw this and see it. I heard it. It was Beatles at the Beeb, a radio show, and they were supposedly allegedly playing live on the air, a Hard Day's Night. And they get up to the guitar solo, and you could tell that the engineer cut in the live the guitar solo from the record it was the one that you and i talked about that they sped up so it wasn't played live you could tell it was an edit in post and I went, that's kind of weird can't george play that guitar solo because it obviously wasn't the same guitar solo it wasn't live right and so i started to question but then then i discovered well before i discovered you i wrote this book i, I brought this on this is this is breathe this is my it's a novella and it's a book of historical fiction where I hypothesize that John Lennon faked his death. I'm not saying he did that, but that's the, the narrative of the story. And what I thought about that, I thought, well, what if double fantasy? I thought, what does that mean? And allegedly it's a flower that John Lennon discovered in Bermuda or something. But but double fantasy, isn't that kind of like have your cake and eat it too? Like, wouldn't that be kind of weird if John Lennon killed himself because he was sick of being famous and he wanted to go off and do something else? He could still reap the benefits of all the money of the Beatles, but everybody thinks he's dead. Then he gets raised up higher than Paul. He becomes Christ-like. And, and if you're watching this, I'm not saying that's what happened. It's just, just something's kind of fun to think about. But then I ran into your channel, and I'm like, who is this guy? This guy, Mike. And he's got all these, ah, the Beatles are fake, and they're a boy band. I'm like, what? I never, ah. And I started to listen to you, and you had this methodical, well-thought-out show piece by piece by piece, date by date by date. There's no way that this band could have written, recorded, and done all the things that they did while touring and photo shoots and making movies. The timeline doesn't add up. And then I read, I can't think of the author's name, about the music scene on the West Coast. Dave McGowan? Dave McGowan, that's it. He's got a great book about how the West Coast sound is all fake. Laurel Canyon. And I thought, well, this Mike Williams guy, and oh no, it's all fake. And I kind of put you together with this with this other author, and I went, wow, it is possible that that the Beatles had musicians come in and play for them because they're not technically very good musicians. And it is possible that somebody said, hey, we like your look, we like your charisma, we're going to write some songs for you. You go up there, we'll say tell everybody you wrote them, and you're just going to basically be our puppets. And I thought, well, that is possible. And I never even thought of it before. And I think your videos really laid it out so clearly and concisely. I don't know how anybody could, could. Um, I mean, I know how people could say it's not possible, but there, there's other things too. I mean, there's other things, as I, as I told you privately, that my brother and I had listened to the White Album backwards when I was like in fifth grade. And, and I knew about the Paul is Dead thing when I was in fifth, sixth grade. And we had listened to uh, a bunch of things backwards about Paul being dead. And I, so I've always kind of had that in the back of my head. There's always been pictures of Paul. There's a picture I sent to you of Paul that I saw in 1975 where he's being, you know, uh, attacked by fans. But it doesn't look like Paul McCartney. The caption says it's Paul McCartney, but that's not Paul McCartney. It's not his hair. It's not his face. It's something that kind of looks like him. And I, even as a kid, I went was that guy that wasn't Paul McCartney so it, it kind of was always been in there even though I was such a huge fan I kind of always wondered who was who are these guys and how did they go from like like you said they got to, they started touring Hamburg in like 1960 and all of a sudden in 63 they were the number one band in England like that doesn't make any sense I mean you're a songwriter I'm a musician. I know hundreds of guys, just like you and me. Some of them are better than us. Some of them are worse. They never saw the light of day. And these guys, they were playing cover tunes in some stanky bar in Germany. All of a sudden, 
<laughs> they just got a recording contract in England with with EMI. It's just the story doesn't make any sense when you really step out of it. So um, I've always questioned in the back of my mind. It was originally at the back of my mind, and then it, it came more to the forefront when I started seeing your videos and I read um, Dave McGowan. Yeah. So, Peter, let me ask you, because I've talked about this from my perspective as a songwriter. So what caught me, as you know, and my audience knows, is when I started watching Deconstructing Rubber Soul. And I really didn't know the Rubber Soul story. I didn't know it until I bought that documentary. And I got about 15, 20 minutes in, and they said they're going to write from scratch, essentially from scratch. Some will argue they had bits and pieces of songs going in, but... But essentially, it was a blank piece of paper, 16 songs, write, uh, learn, rehearse, arrange, mix in 30 days. And that's what caught me. I'm like, there's no way that could happen. So you have five albums of music that you have written. Peter is a very good musician, a very good guitar player. So instead of Mike telling people from my perspective, what's your perspective as a songwriter about 16 songs from scratch in 30 days? I mean, to get the whole thing nailed down. Crazy. It's crazy because, okay, I'm a solo artist, but uh, several of my CDs were recorded here in Ohio at a place called Harvest Recording. And the producer is a genius musician. He plays uh, like trumpet and sax and bass and piano and, he, and he, he's mastered them. I mean, this is a brilliant man. And he and I would go in and I'd say, I have this song. Let's record it. And he'd say, okay. And so we would lay down a basic track, but then we'd have to put other things on top of it, the bass and get a drummer or whatever. And, you know, one song for just me, you know, I can't remember some of it. This is over 20 years ago, but it took a long time. For my first CD of 12 songs, it took months to make. And they were just kind of kind of ideas I had. And granted, I didn't have anybody to write. He didn't write the songs with me. And the songs were kind of already finished, but some of them weren't. I think it's impossible. I don't care who your partner is. Because if you're sitting down in a room with another musician, whether he's your friend or not, number one, you're battling with egos. And you both have different creative ideas. Then you've got to figure out what to agree on. Then you've got to figure out how to play it and arrange it. Then you've got to record it, and you you can't screw up. You can't fuck up the recordings because back then you just had to do it over. There was no right. digital – like today, I can just cut and paste my chorus. I don't have to re-sing it. But back then, if you if Ringo screwed up, uh, we got to do it again. So, so this is another thing that most viewers don't know is that even bands like Boston – I think Boston had given the record company a demo that's almost identical to their first album. And it sounds almost as good, but the record company said, no, we're going to re-record it. And I think they brought in other musicians to play. That may or may not be true, but this is why they do it. In the recording studio, you have to have all the levels right. And you can't have a drummer who doesn't hit the drum pretty consistently on the beat or where they want him to hit it or how loud they want to hit it. If he's too soft or too hard, if he hits the, the rim of the snare and not the skin, it, they got to start over back then. So you got to bring in guys that are skilled. They're on their they're on their chops. They sit down. They play the guitar. They're done. They do the lead part. They're done. They do the drums. And so because it costs them money, it's an hourly rate, and you're costing EMI, Abbey Road, whoever it was, thousands of dollars per song. So you've got to get guys to come in that know what they're doing. And the Beatles weren't that good. They weren't sharp enough to finger pick. And so I think it's far fetched. At best, now that I know what I've been through in the studio, it's, you know, I'm just one guy. It, it took me months to make my first CD. And you're nervous. There's so many different factors when the, when the red light goes on, as the Beatles say. In the old days, they turn a red light on, meaning you're recording. You get a different frame of mind. You get scared. You get uptight. You, you're thinking too much. You get the yips, I guess they call it. And if you're not in the right frame of mind, you screw up and you screw up and you screw up. And when you hear the sound quality of what they actually released back then, it blows your mind compared to the Stones or the Who and some of these other bands at the time. The Beatles recordings are just like far superior. And I've always wondered, did Abbey Road have different compression and EQ? Did they have different 
I mean, how did they get this crisp, clean sound compared to the Stones, which to me sounds really muddy. Their early stuff sounds muddy and murky, and ugh, I don't buy it. I, I just don't. Now that you've explained it, I never thought about it. There has to be a a UK, what do you call the the group of uh, the wrecking, uh, wrecking crew. crew, a wrecking crew of the UK or something that came in. And you've mentioned a couple of different drummers that claim they've played on Beatle Records. I believe it because you've got guys. I've seen guys that can just pick up the guitar and they just play it. They just play the song from note to note without a mistake. And they're far superior to me. And there's professionals, guys, studio musicians. That's why they're there. So at the very least, the argument that somebody else played on their records is completely possible. There's no way that these four guys who couldn't play a note in the cavern just walked into the studio like it was nothing and just knocked out. 14 songs in their first album in like four hours or something. I uh, put a clip up of um, Glenn Campbell from July of 1968. He was co-hosting the um, Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour, and he was introducing Cream. So Eric Clapton, uh, Jack Bruce, and Ginger Baker. In the introduction, he said that Cream, they played on Beatle recordings, as well as the Rolling Stones, Donovan, and he lists a couple of other big acts. So here we have a situation where Glenn Campbell, who was with the Wrecking Crew, the Wrecking Crew was L.A. based, and they were on an unbelievable amount of pop records in the 60s and 1970s, flat out telling us in the introduction of Cream before they played, that they played on Beatle recordings. So it's interesting how there are these, uh, these little tidbits that are out there that when they first say it, going back to 1968, I'm sure it just went over a lot of people's heads. But once we know what we know now and we go back and we watch some of this stuff, you pick up on it. So I just put that out today. Um, but I'm, I'm glad, Peter, to get your perspective on it, because sometimes, you know, I get caught in mouth because I'm talking about it from my angle. Probably what a lot of people don't know is I do have a lot of musicians, songwriters and some producers who subscribe to my channel they have the, the exact same position that you and I have with regard to their music now. Um, it's just that a lot of them won't step out and talk about it because a lot of them are still in the business. Sometimes people ask me, like, how come some of these larger music channels on YouTube don't ever talk about it? I said, well, they can't talk about it because they're playing to the, the official narrative that's the base of their subscribership, whether it be the Beatles or any other band. A lot of these channels have a lot of subscribers and uh, their channels are a major source of revenue for them. In some cases, I would say it's probably their livelihood. And uh, for them to step out and talk about uh, the Beatles as an example, as something other than what the official narrative explains, will be the kiss of death to their channels. Oh, yeah. They will lose their subscriber base. They will lose their revenue. And so now that on top of the fact that many of them do believe the official narrative around the Beatles, but I'm pretty sure there are those that are questioning it, but they go along to get along because, you know, they've got their channel with their tons of subscribers and they've got their revenue stream and they're not going to jeopardize that. I mean, that's my, you know, my take on it whenever I get asked that question. Sometimes I get asked in the comment section. Yeah, I think another thing that I think is funny is you hear – I just heard a, an audio recording with John Lennon saying that during – when they were touring when, in the 64 to 66 years that there were whores and everything up in their rooms and stuff like this. And, and there was drugs and women. He, I think he said prostitutes or he said whores or something like that. So Ron Howard, like five, six years ago, I don't, I don't remember how long it was, he releases eight days a week. And I'm like, okay, great. We're going to get the real inside story of the Beatles touring years. And I was like – in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, well, this is, you know, this is Opie from Mayberry. He's not going to tell the real story. He's he's Ron Howard. He's got to make it look good. Sure enough, he just releases this garbage film about the good, good, good mop top guys just sitting in the rooms drinking coffee and rum and coke. <laughs> and I'm like, come on. I was 22 once. We all have sex drives. Regardless of what our preferences are, we, we want action. You got four guys at the height of their career with women throwing themselves and men throwing themselves at them. There's no way these guys were sitting in a room drinking rum and coke and, and tea. 
And I'm like, this is all such crap. They just keep pushing this. And the people that believe it, I see the comments from this Now and Then song, how the song brings them tears. And, oh, I remember when I was 12. I was like, stop it. These guys are phony. They're just so phony. Who knows how many kids they've left around the world? I'm sorry to say that, but they were guys. They were, you know, who knows what they were doing? And and I think the whole narrative is this. They packaged them as these nice guys from Liverpool who, you know, were just out just hardworking musicians and they made it and they're they're like the guys next door but they weren't and and the real people we don't even know who they really were or who's who now and who's really dead and and it's made so much money man think about how much money the guitar industry has made since the beatles hit the scene right you can't even find a good guitar anymore they're all junk in guitar centers made made in korea and you know you have to pay out the nose for a really good guitar now like but back then Nobody bought guitars. Can you imagine how responsible they are for the entire sale of guitars, bass, drums, all of it? And not just the Beatles, but, you know, the entire British invasion sparked a whole new industry. So if you if you submarine what we know as the British invasion, if you undermine that and the West Coast sound, you know, they're probably petrified that they'll lose a huge income stream from their record sales, if it's really found out that this is all a lie, people, well, most people wouldn't believe it. But I think of all the things they did to change culture, you know, we won't get into the whole Tavistock thing because I just discovered Tavistock because of you, and they're just now discovering that. But I think it's a whole cultural thing. It's a cultural engineering thing that they used. They brought the Beatles into the U.S. right after a huge trauma of uh, Kennedy being assassinated. They went, this is it. This is the time. Let's get them over there now. And we'll take advantage of the sadness and the American hearts and the traumatize and give them something to hope for. But but there's more to it than that in my head. It has a lot to do with other things that I think undermines Western culture as a whole that I think is they've used music. And I use Hollywood for everything, including the media, to shape our minds, which I could go off on all day about now. When you mentioned um – the JFK assassination with the Beatles, which was their second uh, UK release. And again, folks, their official records were their UK albums. That was released on November 22nd, 1963. It's the same day that JFK was assassinated. A lot of people don't know this, and it's mentioned in memoirs, that they held off EMI Capital, because Capital came in under EMI. EMI was the, the parent company. They held off on releasing Meet the Beatles in the U.S. on the Capitol label until I think it was January of 1964 because they didn't want the Kennedy assassination to hurt record sales in the U.S. So they were thinking in terms of economics and sales and profit and stuff like that. It wasn't done because they were being sensitive to the assassination. They were doing it because they didn't want their record sales to be hindered by releasing it on the same day that Kennedy was assassinated. So the other other question I wanted to ask you, Peter, you you mentioned um, now and then, and this was interesting. And I I think you might've watched a video where I talked about this. When when it first came out and I listened to it, I I was just not impressed at all. I, I thought the whole song was just average at best. You know, with me, because of all the work I've done over the last seven and a half years, it's going to be eight years next year. Sometimes it's better for me to allow somebody else to come out <laughs> and with my sentiments, because otherwise they'll say, oh, you know, Mike's just negative on the Beatles. So, But what happened was when the Now and Then, which is the newly released, quote, Beatles song, which is really a John Lennon song, which was, like you said, Peter, in a shoebox in a closet somewhere since 1977, when it first came out, you did a review of it. And you reflected my exact sentiments. And I said, well, thank God Peter did this because now I don't have to do it. <laughs> I could point back to your view and, or your review of the, uh, of the song. And, um, you know, I could talk to it from that perspective. So what, why don't you tell us a little bit about when you did hear the song, what were your thoughts? I had already heard the song in bootleg the bootleg version of it that has been rolling around the internet and the world for years. Um, and I didn't like it then. It, it just, real love, free as a bird, and now and then, to me, 
sound like funeral dirges. I mean, especially um, the freeze. They all sound this murky. And they're plodding along. There's like, ugh. I, this is like this is why he left them alone. He didn't want to record them, in my opinion, if they're really his songs. So when I first heard it, I like I said in my video, I, I was on the toilet <laughs> when I heard it, and I thought it was apropos because I went. Ugh. I just almost got sick when I heard it. When I first heard the first few notes, I'm like, oh, no, they really did, did redo this song. And I, I, I have to give it – I liked the way they separated his vocals from his piano. And that, that that did sound good. They did a great job with the AI. But then they bring in the orchestra and the, the, the Philharmonic or who, the London Philharmonic or whoever these people are. And it's it's it's, it's, it's a money grab. It's a way of trying to perpetuate something that's been dead for 50 years. I just got – I thought it was sad. I thought it was sad and it was kind of depressing. And I felt bad. For the first time I heard a Beatles song, I, I didn't feel good. I felt like, oh, this is awful. There, and, and these poor people out there that haven't come out of the, the haze or the fog of Beatlemania, they have manipulated these people once again and got them to buy T-shirts with this horrible graphic design done by whatever his name is. They're, they're buying coffee mugs. They're buying 12-inch singles for $30 a piece just with two songs. And they and I thought, oh, my God, they re-released Love Me Do. I'm telling you, even when I was a kid, I hated that song. It's a horrible song. I despise Love Me Do. And if, they, if it ever just fell off the face of the earth, we'd be better off without it. And they re-released it because it was their first, I guess, their first single. And this is now their last single. And now what they're doing is they're saying the song is a is a message from John to Paul, like oh great oh oh I'm all choked up because he's singing to Paul, but he's basically saying ah every now and then I think about you, <laughs> you know every now and then. So what is the song really saying if you just look at it as it is? It really doesn't say much. Yeah, every now and then I think of you and okay, it's kind of an insult I think. It crossed my mind once in a while. You know, it's not like I, it's not like I, I love you so much. I think about you all the time. That kind of song. So I was like, ah, every now and then. That's how I took it. But I thought it was a desperate attempt uh, to make some money and also by perpetuating artificial intelligence. It's this huge buzz around the AI thing, which is putting a lot of people out of work. I appreciate the production of it. But outside of that, I, uh, I, I won't listen to it again. What did you think of the mix? I didn't like the mix personally. Um, my initial reaction was I thought it was awful. I heard it on my cell phone, on my iPhone, and it was sounded kind of distorted. It sounded like there's a lot of high end uh, distortion in it. But I don't know if that was my cell phone because I've heard it again in different speakers, and it sounds it sounds okay. I think it sounds kind of muddy, but I don't know how much you could really do with it because I think they stripped away John's piano, put in Paul playing piano, but I don't know. My initial reaction was it was poorly mixed, and I thought Giles Martin should 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 quit his day job because I don't think he's got the ears that his dad had. I really I think he ruined Sgt. Pepper's and his remix, and I, I don't know what who's advising this guy, but I don't think he's got the right ears for that job. But that's just my amateurish opinion. <laughs> well, listen, anytime we listen to music, it's subjective. Some people will love a song, while you and I may not like it, and but. Hey, you know, but we're entitled to our opinion on it. The, the thing I noticed about the song is that now and then is the inversion of yesterday and today. Oh. I thought that was very interesting. And yesterday and today is really is a very significant album cover because first it started off as the butcher cover and then it was the paste over with Paul in the trunk. And it is a, uh, I call it a, or I, I should say I consider it a pretty significant Paul is dead album cover, whether it's the Butcher or if it's the trunk cover. So we have Now and Then and Yesterday and Today. I, I thought that that was interesting. And going back to what you were saying about making money on it, right after the song was released, they then released, they reissued the Red and Blue Greatest Hits albums. And they put Now and Then on that album, along with um, some additional songs. I think some of them were covers. Going back, you know, to the to the early albums, Please Please Me and with the Beatles. I have to take a look. They've got rolling rollover Beethoven on I think on sixty two to sixty six, I think. They set the stage, and I do agree with you because I brought it up too that there is an AI component to this to sell people on artificial intelligence. 
but it also is another money grab because somebody wrote in the comment section, well, no, the, you know, they're giving the song away for free because it's on YouTube. Well, you know what? Nope, they packaged it with the Red and Blue album. It was basically a precursor to this larger marketing program that's taking place right now, you know? So anyway, that's just my two cents on it. They're also getting paid every time it gets played on YouTube. You you, you can bet your, your butt that whoever represents the Beatles in their estates sat down with YouTube and said, I don't care if Peter Frampton's getting ripped off, you're gonna pay us 50 cents on the dollar for every time we get a play or something like that. You know darn well they're getting paid because they're they're the Christ of all rock and roll. So you might you might think it's free, but they're they're getting paid whether whether you pay for it or not. I think that's pessimistic, but that that's the truth. It's all about money. What do you see coming up for you in the future as far as music goes or your artwork or as a filmmaker? Anything else that you have on the horizon that you're thinking about getting into or that you're already into? I've been working on a I had been working on a documentary about a local artist. That one's been kind of shelved for a while. And then I've been recently contacted by other artists to make other documentaries but uh those haven't really there's not much of a story in the one uh so i don't think i'm going to pursue that i've been really focusing a lot on uh, my youtube channel trying to polish that up trying to get it marketed better and get more viewers and i've been doing a lot of painting i do a lot of acrylic painting or the new one here that i've been working on and uh, painting is really something i i do that no one sees it's just something I do because I, I get satisfaction out of it and it feels good to do it. It's kind of meditative or uh, like going into a meditative state when I do it. I go into a different frame of mind. And um, I think that's about it. I mean, I making documentaries is is a very draining process when you're by yourself. So I uh, am very cautious about doing it again, jumping in with both feet because this, this one project I was working on for a year. And uh, the guy I was working with just kind of disappeared. He ghosted me. And I don't like that. <laughs> I don't like no reason. Just he had other things to do all of a sudden. And uh, I don't know if he got PBS to do a story. It was a pretty pretty good story, too. And I was like, I wasn't making any money off of it. And uh, so I'd rather just focus on my painting and see what happens. So uh, my YouTube channel, I've got a podcast, too. I've got uh, PT Papa Mind Revolution. I just released a new podcast called A Hot Mess, where I, it's it's based off of my documentary Road to Forgiveness, where I talk about my experiences being raised in an alcoholic family, and I've been focusing on that, trying to tell more of the story behind the movie, and I've got quite a few downloads on that. So I do. I, I'm a very kind of reclusive guy these days. I'd like to stay behind the scenes of the camera and not really rub elbows with too many people anymore it just seems to be too frustrating so i just kind of do my thing here in the house so that's about it right now the best place peter for the audience to catch up with you is it your pt pop youtube channel or is there a website or both yeah uh, well i've got a website which is skatingbearstudios.com uh, but pt pop on youtube is the best place that's where i i post the most i have a lot of shorts and videos on there and I have my podcast, but I, I don't I only post something every couple of months on my podcast. But yeah, PT Pop on YouTube is the best place. Well, Peter, it's been a pleasure having you on. I'm, I'm glad that um, you accepted the invitation. I had a, a great time when I spoke with you going back uh, a few months ago. So it's been a very pleasant discussion. And folks, again, I really recommend watching Peter's documentary. Road to Forgiveness, and also the second one, um, The Artist, which I think was your first documentary. Yeah, 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 it is. And thanks, Mike. It's been great. I'm so glad that you invited me because I was really looking forward to this today, and I'm glad I, I ran across all your Beatle conspiracy videos, I guess is what everybody <laughs> calls them. <laughs> no, thank you, Peter. Thank you so much. And um, stick around after the uh, we uh, shut down here, and we'll just chit-chat a little bit. But I'm going to have the show out as soon as I can. Uh, probably within the next, uh, I would say, maybe 10 to 14 days. And I'll send you a link when it's up. Awesome. Great. Thanks, Mike. All right, Peter. Thank you.